Uh, okay, so welcome everybody and thank you for joining us again at PAW. Uh, today we have uh, Christina Skreb from University of Zagreb, uh, who will talk about bilinear embedding in Orlet spaces for divergence form operators with complex coefficients. Christina, it's all yours. Thank you, Irina, uh, and I would like well, I would like uh, to thank again the organizer for for inviting me to give this talk. I'll try not to be too technical, not go into too many technical details, but just to you know somehow uh, try to explain to you what is the problem we're talking about here and how are we trying to uh, how, how did we uh, resolve it in the end? Okay. So uh, you can see, so first I would like to say this is a joint work with uh, my former advisor, Vyekoslav Kovac, also from University of Zagreb. And we actually um, decided to take on this project after a um, project we had together with uh, Andrea Carbonaro and Oliver Dragice, which, which was also related to some sort of embeddings actually trilinear embeddings, which was a natural uh, generalization of their previous results on some bilinear embeddings. And then we uh, tried to tackle the case in Orlib spaces, which makes them more general than LP spaces. So let's try to see what, what we're talking about here. So the outline of the talk, first I will um, say something about bilinear embeddings in general and divergence form operators. Then I will give you a short, really short introduction into Orlit spaces. Then I will talk about the main result, which is the bilinear embedding in Orlit spaces. I will give you a short outline of the proof with, with the main ingredients, just so you can see what's happening. And then in the end, we'll talk about the Bellman function, which is used to prove this bilinear embedding we're talking about. Okay, so first let's start with uh, an introduction to bilinear embeddings and divergence form operators. Okay, so what are bilinear embeddings? Bilinear, um, uh, by, by the term bilinear embedding, we, we are calling a sub, by, by sublinear estimate of this form. So what do we have here? We have some sort of a, a semi-group applied to the functions f and g, and we integrated over rd and uh, uh, the interval from zero to infinity, and we want, uh, we want to bound this quantity with uh, some constant c and the norm of functions f and g. Okay, so what are f and g? f and g are some complex functions. And here in this notation, there are some mutual, uh, mutually dual Banach space norms. As I said, those uh, T and T tilde are some operator semigroup. And this uh, like absolute value, it's not X, uh, uh, actually denotes the standard Euclidean norm on the complex space CD. Okay, and it's important here to uh, emphasize that this constant can be uh, can depend on the norms and on the semigroups we're using, but it's not dependent on the functions. So, uh, I mean, why are uh, the estimates of this form uh, interesting? Well, they have been used in uh, various papers by various art, uh, author, uh, authors. Uh, in harmonic analysis to prove a lot of different things. So one of the early examples of using some, uh, some type of uh, bilinear um, embeddings was uh, first used a, uh, by uh, Stephanie Petr Michel and Sasha Wolberg, and also by uh, Peja Nazarov and Sasha Wolberg, who studied such embed uh, embeddings in the context of trying to prove some estimates for the alhof berling operator. Okay, so maybe you, at first glance, you don't see what's the connection between the alhof berling operator and uh, bilinear embeddings, but we can see it right here. Like we know that we can write the alhof berling operator in this way. Okay, 
So uh, what, what are R1 and R2? Those are nothing less than the restrans, uh, linear uh, risk transforms on the plane. And then we have this identity. Okay, so we can write the integral of the uh, squared risk transform in this way. And you can see actually this right-hand side completely looks like the left-hand side on the bilinear embedding. Okay, so how, how, how they actually proved estimates for the alpha burling operator? Well, by proving this quantity that's, uh, that's on the right-hand side and getting some type of bilinear embedding. Here by TT, uh, it, it's not a general semigroup. It's actually the heat extension of the functions F and G. Okay. Of course, that, that's not, only, uh, not an only example. There are a lot of examples. We will only uh, mention some of them. Uh, also, Volberg, Sasha Volberg continued this research together with Oliver Dragicevic, and they actually established a series of dimension-free estimates of type one, which means uh, uh, a series of bilinear embeddings. So uh, in which context did they use the bilinear embeddings? For instance, they proved some dimension-free littlewood paley estimates and also some dimension-free estimates for the Schrodinger operators. Then after that, uh, Oliver Dragicevic also continued uh, that work with Andrea Carbonaro and they uh, proved also several bilin uh, bilinear embeddings and use them now in other, uh, other settings. So what are the settings that they were using it? Uh, they actually proved dimension-free estimates associated with Riemannian manifolds. Actually, what they proved here is estimates for the risk transform this defined on the Romanian manifolds. How did they do it? They used similar, first they used similar expressions like the one of uh, Peter Michel and Wahlberg or Nazarov and Wolberg. They also use the bilinear embeddings to, uh, to um, for functional cal calculus for generator of symmetric contraction semigroups. And also they prove the bilinear embedding for the divergent form operators with complex coefficients. So this was the bilinear embedding I was mentioning at the beginning. Uh, and this was like this 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 paper was how we started to uh, go into the subject. So with these two authors, we actually did the trilinear embedding, and then we tried the generalization in a different way by um, generalizing this bilinear embedding to Euler spaces, which I will talk about a bit later. Okay. So in the all of the mentioned results, the norm that you see it, that appear in the bilinear embedding are just standard LP norms. They can be either, either weighted or unweighted, but it, it's always about the LP norms, okay? And here we will not use uh, LP norms, but more general, general norms defined on Orlit spaces, okay? So uh, now we will talk about divergent form operators. First, let's start with the definition of ellip ellipticity of a matrix function. So what is a matrix function? A matrix function, sorry, a matrix function with uh, L infinity coefficients is, is, I mean, nothing, nothing else than a matrix where each element of the matrix is a L infinity function. Okay. And now we can define when this matrix function is elliptic. So we say that this matrix function A is only formally elliptic or, or assertive if we have these two, um, these two conditions. So the first condition is that this quantity uh, big lambda has to be uh, finite. And the second condition is that this other quantity, little lambda, which is the essential of infimum of minimum of the real part of the matrix function applied to, to C 
and then uh, we, we take a scalar product with C has to be strictly positive. Okay, so this is a, a well known a well known definition. We won't spend much time about it. Okay, so now we define what is an elliptic operator in divergent form, in divergence form. So if we have this uh, matrix function A, we can def uh, define an operator that we call that we call uh, L A which uh, applied to f is defined as minus the divergence of a applied to the nabla f. Okay. Of course, if we, if we uh, remember that a is just a matrix, we can calculate this uh, right-hand side and get something like this. Of course, in the classical sense, this quantity is only defined when the coefficients of a are smooth. And, and the, 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 the coefficients of A don't have to be smooth, but then we'll see how, do, how we uh, define such uh, operators if we have non-smooth coefficients. Uh, how can you think of the, this divergence form operators? Well, if you take the most simplest example, if you take uh, A to be just the identity matrix, you will see that this uh, operator is just my, uh, the negative Laplacian. Okay. So like I said, generally, when we don't have smooth coefficients, we can define the operator LA uh, by duality. Okay, we just define that uh, the app, uh, operator LA applied to a function F and then uh, taking the scalar product with G is this integral. Okay, uh, and we will also uh, not only consider these operators, but we will also consider strongly continuous uh, operator semigroup on L2, which are get, uh, generated by uh, operators LA. And how do we how do we define those uh, semigroups? Well, uh, in the most you know natural way, this is just the exponential of minus. So TTA is just the exponential of minus TLA. So uh, if, again, if we take A to be just the identity matrix, here you will get uh, exactly the heat semigroup. So applying uh, TTA to F will be, would be a heat extension. So this is why it's natural to, you know, uh, even consider such types of objects. Uh, I will, uh, emphasize now that for convenience, now all through the paper, we uh, all through the talk, we are working with functions that are uh, CC infinity. Okay, and now uh, there's a new concept there wa that was introduced first, but not first, but uh, by Carbonaro and Dragic, which, which is called P ellipticity. So P ellipticity is like a generalization of ellipticity. And uh, it says that a matrix is P elliptic if this quantity is strictly positive. So if you take P equal to, you will get the standard ellipticity condition. So why did they even introduce this, uh, this P ellipticity condition? Well, for various reasons, uh, they needed to prove the bilinear embedding theorem uh, for um, divergence form operators with non-smooth coefficients. Then they use it in the context of contractivity uh, of uh, semigroups and various other things. Um, independently of Carbonaro and Dragicevich, an equivalent condition was also discovered by Dindos and Pfeiffer, and it was a result of stre strengthening an earlier condition introduced by Childan Mazia, which we'll we, uh, mention a bit later. Okay, so just to um, also say a few things about this P ellipticity. Uh, so if we have two Ps, uh, that are between two and infinity, and P1 is less than P2, then we have this series of inequalities. And also elliptic matrices are 
That means uh, those are two elliptic matrices, which is a, a superset of P1 elliptic matrices, and which is a superset of P2 elliptic matrices. And of course, in the end of this uh, series, we get real elliptic matrices, which means that real matrices that are real and elliptic are actually P elliptic for every P. And this, so this notion somehow bridges the gap between real and com complex elliptic matrix functions. And so what was the theorem they proved uh, using this con concept also of uh, ellipticity? So they proved the bilinear embedding theorem for complex uh, elliptic operators, which says that if we have two matrices A and B, which are complex and P elliptic, then we have a bilinear embedding that looks like this, okay? So uh, on the uh, right-hand side, we have the LP and LQ norms of F and G. Q is, of course, the uh, dual exponent of P. And this, this constant actually looks like this. And you can see that it depends only on the matrices A and B and the quantities lambda and the P elliptic uh quantities and they don't uh, they don't depend on the dimension and they also don't depend on the functions f and g so how how are those type how did they prove uh, this theorem so the basic con concept is like this uh this uh type of bi bilinear embedding is actually established using the heat flow method and by using this heat flow method, which was, of course, previously used also by Sasha Wahlberg, Stephanie Petr Michal, and uh, Nazarov, uh, Feja Nazarov, uh, is um, one of the key ingredients in using this heat flow method is construct, uh, constructing a special function with certain convexity properties that's called the Bellman function. So in this case, uh, they, so I have a typo here, they use the Bellman function constructed by Nazarov and Trail, which is a famous fr uh, function from uh, 1996, which was used also improving uh, various different results, and the function looks like this. And the fact that this uh, function consists only of powers was uh, very important because a lot of properties of the powers were used. So since we are trying to uh, pass from LP to general Orlit spaces, we will have to modify this function in a way. So it also works for general Young functions, but of course, with a lot of additional restrictions. OK. So let's talk about Orlit spaces. I will only. Uh, only only say a few few basic things so I can uh, explain what is the estimate that we proved in the end. Okay, so uh, Orlit spaces are uh, we can think of them as a generalization of LP spaces uh, in a way. So um, how do we start? We start with a young function phi. And what is Yang function? The Yang function is, is a convex function, which uh, has the value zero in zero. And if you look at the ratio of the function uh, phi evaluated in, in S over S, this quantity tends to zero when S tends to zero, and this quantity tends to infinity when S tends to infinity. And when we have a Yang function phi, we can define uh, they, they're conjugated or complementary Young function, which we usually know by Psi, like this. Okay, so uh, formally it's defined as the supremum, but then it can be shown that this is, it's the same of this integral. Of course, the, of course this only makes sense if the inverse of the derivative of phi is well-defined and integrable. So we might not always be able to use uh, 
this definition, but this is always, always correct. But in our cases, we will have nice enough young functions, so this definition will also be used. Okay, and one of the main um, inequalities that uh, are very helpful for proving some things is the young inequality, which, uh, um, which holds for a, a pair of complementary young functions. And it, it's, it states that uh, the product of S and P can be uh, estimated by uh, phi, of, uh, phi of S plus Psi of T. Uh, Christina, okay. excuse me, uh, Christina, yes? on the previous slide. When this you, one? Yes, when you write okay. the integral formula, this yeah. minus, minus one means one over? No, no, it means the inverse. Inverse, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So that's why sometimes it's not it's not uh, defined uh, well, and that's why it cannot always be used. But in our case, it will it will all all work. Okay. So on ordered spaces, we can define uh, the Luxembourg norm. So we can, which will be the norm we will be working on on this space, and uh, uh, the Luxembourg Luxembourg norm is defined in this way. So we take the infimum over all alpha such that uh, when we integrate phi of f over alpha, the integral is less than equal than one. And uh, I would like to emphasize that although the functions phi and psi are like complementary conjugated young functions, these two norms do not be do not need to be mutually dual. So, but we can achieve duality if we impose a certain condition, and that's a doubling condition. So, if the function phi so, uh, phi, yes, uh, satisfies the doubling condition, which means it satisfies something like this, it will guarantee duality. So the norms are then dual to each other and the spaces that we work on are also dual to each other in that way. Okay, so of course we won't be working, uh, I mean, of course, unfortunately, we won't be uh, working with completely general young functions because, it, it was impossible to prove anything that way, but we had to impose uh, additional conditions to get certain type of estimates. So what are additional assumptions we had to impose on functions phi and psi? First, of course, they are mutually conjugate young functions. We, it's natural, and we assume that they are C1 on uh, the interval zero to infinity, including zero and C2, on the open interval from zero to infinity. Also, we will assume that they are convex, which means that the second derivative of both uh, phi and psi are positive. Uh, those are the most logical three conditions first to impose, but then of course we will need more. And uh, we will need that the derivative of psi is strictly convex, on zero infinity, and that the quantity psi uh, phi derivative uh, over s tends to zero as s tends to zero. Also, we will need uh, the condition that the supremum over all s, um, s times uh, phi derivative over phi is finite, and that the infimum of s times the uh, double derivative of phi over phi derivative is less than the supremum of the same quantity and those two are between one and infinity. So why do we need all these conditions? Well, we want, actually we want our functions to behave like powers. So we don't want them to be completely general young functions, we want them to behave like powers, and those are some of the conditions uh, that also powers have. Uh, okay, and now if we if we remember the, what are the, the defining properties of the functions psi and phi, and the first three assumptions, they actually implied that uh, phi derivative and psi derivative are mutually inverse 
uh, increasing bijections on this uh, interval from zero to infinity, which is also a, a thing that will heavily be used. Also, you can, you can see that the conditions four, five, and six are all right uh, written in the terms of the function phi. But of course, we can also write them in the terms of the function psi and get these three conditions. They're equivalent, OK? And then when, when we will try to prove some, uh, some things, we will sometimes use the assumptions on phi. Sometimes we will use the assumptions of, on psi, whichever is like more natural to, to us at the moment, OK? Uh, a good thing is that when we impose all these conditions, uh, we automatically uh, get that the doubling condition is also satisfied, which means that both the function phi and the function psi satisfy the doubling condition, which means that something like this is satisfied for some constants k1 and k2. Consequently, of course, the norms uh, uh, the Luxembourg norm, uh, the Luxembourg norm um, um, uh, induced by phi and induced by psi are mutually dual. Okay, so some examples uh, of uh, functions and uh, all its spaces uh, of or lit spaces with fun young functions that satisfy all of our assumptions are the following. Of course, we have the simplest example, which, which are the Lebesgue spaces, the LP Lebesgue spaces. Um, uh, in uh, this case, the functions are just powers. So the first function is SP over P, the second function is SQ over Q, where of course uh, P and Q are uh, dual exponents, meaning that one, of, that one over P plus one over Q equals one. Then the second example, example are Zygmunt spaces, which are spaces uh, of the form um, LR times log L. And to get those spaces, we just have to take the function psi to be s to the power r times the logarithm of s plus e. Unfortunately, uh, here we only uh, are the only exponents that work are r that are uh, bigger than two that satisfy all of our uh, assumptions that we imposed. Also, two other examples. One is the uh, superposition of powers. So we can take uh, the function psi uh, phi to be uh, sp plus some epsilon times s, uh, s to the power r. And so you can see that this, this function actually behaves like s to the power r for small s and s to the power p for large s. And we can also take a superposition of powers with, with exponents from the interval of one, one from two, like this. OK, so those are, are, are some of the basic examples that satisfy, uh, satisfy all, all of our conditions. So those are some of the Orlich spaces that our estimate will hold for. Hold for. OK, so now let's get to the main result. Let's see what actually we were able to prove. So first, uh, when, I, um, when I talked about the bilinear embedding theorem of uh, uh, Carbonaro and uh, Dragicevic, I mentioned they uh, introduced the notion of p ellipticity. So here we will have to have something similar. So what are we trying to? introduce here, we are trying to introduce something called uh, phi ellipt uh, ellipticity. Of course, because we are now working with not uh, a general uh, a power function, but a general Young function phi. OK, and motivated by the definition of p ellipticity, we, we see that this quantity is a logical choice. Now, if we look at, if, if we look at carefully, what, what can we see? We can see that if we take 
uh, exactly the Lebesgue-Young function, which is the, the power function sp over p, this quantity will become the same quantity uh, that appears in, in the definition of p ellipticity. And even more so, even if the function, uh, the Young function is not a power function, but it's something more general, we can also see that actually this quantity can also be translated in the terms of p ellipticity, but now p is a unique uh, exponent between 2 and infinity such that these conditions are satisfied. So uh, P has to satisfy this, and it can actually be shown that by simplifying this expression that P is the supremum of this quantity plus one. So actually this uh, phi ellipticity is uh, not a novel concept, it's just P ellipticity for a specific P. And uh, actually, what uh, what what uh, proved not proved what uh, why we why we were sure that something uh, something like this is like the right way to go because um, parallel parallelly in in a, in a different centic like uh, uh, Chalde and Mazia who studied LP dissipativity which is uh, equivalent to con contractivity of semigroups, uh, they had also a similar condition to p ellipticity. And um, <clears throat> they said that uh, in the particular case when, uh, when we have a, a matrix function such that the imaginary part is symmetric, so L dis LP dissipativity is equivalent to this condition. And then 15 years later, uh, they, they wanted to introduce something called the functional dissipativity, which was uh, something like uh, LP uh, dissipativity for general, general functions phi. And now the, the, uh, their, conditions, their condition looked something like this. Again, they don't look uh, they, they look like two different conditions, but actually uh, we can reduce the second condition to the first one. How? First in the special case, if the function phi is actually a power, sp over p, those two condition are, uh, conditions are the same. And uh, if we have a general function, then the second condition reduces to the first one for, such, for p such that this holds, okay? And actually, if we uh, simplify this expression a bit, we again get the same p that we did by uh, our kind of general kind of phi um, um, ellipticity condition. Okay, so this is why why we were sure that this is like the right right way to go. So now, when we have this. Uh, phi ellipticity, which we see it's actually p ellipticity for uh, uh, appropriate p, we can we can state our main result. But before stating uh, the result, we still need we still need some uh, additional notation. So we will introduce these quantities m, m tilde, and big m tilde. So those are supremums and infinums of ratios of uh, derivatives of um, derivatives and the function and the second derivative and the first derivative and stuff like that. We know that all of these quantities are actually bounded because it was uh, uh, it were some of the uh, assumptions that we impose on the functions um, phi, uh, phi and psi. Okay, and we set p to be exactly this expression that we uh, showed a bit earlier. And uh, in this context, we see that p is nothing less than the big M tilde plus one. And now, if we have two uh, matrices, matrix function, matrix function uh, A and B, which are p elliptic for this p, 
that uh, so this for this p that we defined above with l2 uh, l infinity coefficients then we have this type of bilinear embedding so you can see the left hand side is the same as the one in uh, Carbonaro and Dragicevich theorem, and now the right-hand side has uh, the Luxembourg norms of f and g. We have the contact, uh, the two constants, cp and d. cp is the same as before, so it's the same constant as uh, in Carbonaro and Dragicevich, and this constant d is actually this one, okay? So we can we can see that this is actually a generalization of the bilin bilinear embedding theorem in LP spaces. So a few remarks. We can notice that the constants depend on a, b, and on functions uh, q and uh, q. Uh, I'm sorry, on functions uh, phi and psi but they uh, don't depend on the dimension. So this is also a dimension-free estimate, uh, estimate, which is a good thing because you usually we want the bilinear embedding uh, theorems estimates to be dimension-free. Okay, uh, some additional remarks. Uh, we can notice, so of course here, here, uh, here in in this talk we are working with uh, a and b with complex coefficients all the time because if we have real coefficients that's uh, a lot more results uh, are there for uh, um, matrices with real coefficients and in this uh, in this um, in uh, our estimate we can see that of course if we have real a and b then the p elasticity condition is satisfied automatically. So of course the same thing, same thing is true. Also, since we know that our functions are doubling, uh, the product that appears on the right hand side can be rewritten as the product uh, like this or this. So using 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 only one, uh, one young function. And in this way, we can um, actually uh, view uh, the estimate as the estimate on the single or uh, space, which can sometimes be useful. Uh, also, it's easy to see that it's enough to prove a dehomogenized estimate. So instead of the this right-hand side, we will have this. So this is something that's also very standard in the Bellman function technique. It was introduced by Nazarov and Trail in the hunt for the Bellman function. It's called the uh, Hölder versus Young trick, which, uh, like what I said, it actually dehomogenizes the right hand side and it makes the estimate easier to prove. And then in the end, we just have to homogenize back to get uh, the original estimate. Okay. So two other remarks uh, are that um, at least uh, as we know, uh, interpolation arguments cannot recover our estimate in its full generality, because if we use a real uh, interpolation, that means uh, Matzenkiewicz type interpolation, we won't cover all the young functions that are covered uh, in our uh, theorem and uh, also complex type interpolation actually uh, is not applicable because uh, the left hand side is not uh, bilinear but it's by sublinear. Uh, unfortunately what we were hoping to prove to get at the beginning before starting this project were uh, not maybe endpoint uh, endpoint 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 estimates, but to get some estimates for all early spaces that are clo close to L1 or, or L infinity. This is not the case. So our estimate does not allow endpoint generalizations. 
Unfortunately, I don't have a time to get into a lot of details here, but basically, if, for instance, we assumed that uh, it's true for a space that it's close, for instance, to uh, L infinity, our estimate would show something like this. And then by interpolating, we will get this type of estimate. And uh, Carbonaro and Dragicevic showed that this above, uh, above estimate can only hold when um, this uh, function uh, phi is less than this. So what, what means if we have like a certain uh, non-negative function, uh, function, I'm sorry, not, not negative, but function that it's not zero, uh, that uh, such a certain plus phi is our condition, we can always take P big enough so this doesn't work, which means we, we cannot get too close to L infinity. And it can be shown in a similar way that we cannot get too close to L1. Okay. Now, uh, since I don't have much time, I will just uh, show a really short outline of the proof and get to the Bellman function at the end. So uh, like I mentioned before, the proof uh, is, uh, is uh, using, is established using the heat flow method, which is, uh, which was uh, um, also used uh, by Carbonaro and Dragicevic. And so our outline is closely following the outline of Carbonaro and Dragicevic, but of course, all the technical details are different. And there's much more te te technical details to be um, careful about because we have more, a more complicated functions that we're working. So we need to construct a Bellman function tailored to a pair of complementary Young function, which will generalize in the end the Nazarov trail Bellman function. Again, this function has to uh, uh, satisfy certain convexity properties, upper bounds, and estimates of the derivatives. Okay. So just uh, let us remember what uh, generalized uh, Hessian and uh, what, uh, what the concept of generalized convexity uh, means. It was introduced by uh, Carbonaro and Dragicevic. So uh, for some function, some function we defined the general Hessian uh, with respect to the pair of matrices A and B as the standard inner product of this quantity and this quantity. And now we say that uh, the function uh, C is uh, convex with respect to the pair of uh, matrices A and B if this generalized Hess Hessian is positive. So it's just like a generalization of standard, standard convexity. Okay, so like I said, we want to, uh, the, the main ingredient, the main part here is to construct a function that satisfies certain properties. And what are those properties? So we want the function to be C1 and piece, uh, piece C 2 with locally integ integrable second derivatives. We want uh, the function to satisfy this upper bound. So of course, stand, standardly here we will have, if, if we're working on LP spaces here, we will have only uh, powers. And now since we're, we, we are working with uh, Young functions, on the right-hand side, we will have the sum of Young functions. We also want the function to uh, satisfy a certain convexity property. So that's always the case with Bellman functions. Uh, actually, since we don't have a zero on the right-hand side, this convexity is sometimes, uh, sometimes called superconvexity. And we also would like to have some derivative estimates. Okay. Uh, but just I would like to emphasize to prove our desired estimate, it will not be enough for the function to be only of class C1 and piecewise uh, uh, C2, we will need a smoother version. So the standard way to do that is modifying the function. So, so what do we do? We take a smooth function, which is defined in a certain way, 
And then we, uh, we define the new function uh, xi nu as the convolution of our original function and this new smooth function. And what is good, now you can uh, think of this function as the smoothened version of the Bellman function, which satisfies more or less the same properties as our, our original Bellman function. So the properties are uh, more or less the same up to some difference to an upper bound and the derivative estimates. Okay, so how does the proof work? First, we prove the estimate for the uh, matrices with smooth coefficients. And then we pass on to general matrices with non smooth coefficients. So we take a, radi a radial uh, C infinity function and we take its dilate. And then we define something that's called a heat flow. A heat flow is defined as this integral. Okay, so th this is this is nothing new. This is this is something uh, that uh, that is more or less standard, which appears in this heat flow method. And now we want to estimate this integral. Okay, so without going into into a lot of details, we estimate this integral from the uh, upper. For, from uh, one side and from the other side, the upper bound is really easy. Okay, we uh, we can expand this integral and get something like this. And now we just use the upper bound of of this function uh, xi that we know. And then for the for the lower uh, uh, lower bound, we also use the properties of the heat flow and the function we constructed. You can see when we expand this, we get this integral that has the Hessian of our function plus some reminder. And then again, by super convexity, we get this, okay? So this is the reminder. So basically the reminder can re be written like that. And now using the estimates uh, for the derivative, it can easily be shown that this reminder actually tends to zero, which we want. Now we just uh, we just combine the uh, upper and lower bound to get something like this, and as you can see, this really reminds us of the estimate we were wanting to, uh, we want to show. This of course goes to zero. We first let nu uh, tend to zero, and then r tend to infinity, and finally we get the estimate we want to get, which is of course the dehomogenized version, and then homogenization gives us our desired estimate. Uh, okay, so uh, for the non-smooth variant, for the non uh, from the for the matrices with non-smooth coefficients, we just take the smooth approximation and then use the smooth case. And just shortly for the end, I would like to uh, show you the Bellman uh, the constructed Bellman function because for me this is the most interesting part. Uh, but I didn't want you know to uh, hassle you with all the technical details. So the function looks like this. Okay, so this is a, a generalization, like I said, of the Nazar trail function. And at first, it looks like there are different variants that uh, that there are different uh, different ways in which we can generalize that function. And of course, they are. But you want also this function to satisfy certain condition. And for instance, where, uh, uh, already when trying to have a, a C1 property, you have a lot of limitations, and then you see what actually you have to you have to get. And of course, if we take this function, and if we plug in uh, for the functions phi and psi to be the standard Lebesgue function, Lebesgue power functions, you get exactly the Nazar of trail function okay up to up to a constant so uh, it's it's a slight modification because the constant is a bit different but but that's it and of course uh in this in this result the most difficult uh, part is uh when once you constructed the function to uh, actually show that it satisfies all the properties you wanted to, to satisfy, because now we're not we're not working with powers anymore. We're working with young functions, and one has to be careful, and that's why we had to impose 
all those conditions to actually uh, enable us to prove the properties that we want to have. Okay, so I think that's it. Sorry. Uh, uh, I hope I wasn't. Uh, no, you're literally like perfect, perfect. In, in a minute, yeah. People. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Thank you. Can I ask a, a stupid question? Of course. Uh, it's just that I'm, you know, whenever I hear bilinear, I, I immediately think of like the sparse domination thing. Um, is there any possible connection? I don't really see where it would be, but I, I, I also don't see it. And actually, I have no idea. I haven't thought about it that way, but I don't think so. I don't see how, how one would use how one would use sparse here. But um, so and I, I, I wanted to ask also just uh, just like in, in broad strokes um, about how did you get like the mean inequality for this Bellman function? Is it the same as for the Nazarov uh, Volberg function? Uh, well, I mean, you don't, you actually don't get the, uh, the, like you said, the inequality, we, we work, uh, uh, everything continuously. So we, we, mm -hmm. we don't have the, the main inequality in the standard way. We're just working mm -hmm. with like this equivalent convexity property. So this is, this is what we want. Sorry. Okay, so you know, you know, you can pass, you know, from the main inequality mm -hmm. to the some sort of super convexity property with the with the Hessian, and the other way back. So, back. so here mm -hmm. we, we don't even have, you know, like the main inequality in that in that way, but we're just, you know, ah, checking. so you you directly that's that's all you have. It's just the exactly the exactly because I think oh, it wow. would be okay. it would be impossible. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, I don't know where you would get the uh, like a uh, what I think of as a main inequality. Yes, I I know what you mean as a main inequality. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. You don't get something. You don't need something like that here because mm -hmm. you work only in the continuous setting. So you okay. don't have, you don't even need anything discrete. So you work directly with a Hessian. Yes, exactly. Oh, awesome. Okay. So, uh, so but can you get the main inequality of some? Orlich type from from this no i have no idea we haven't even tried because i mean we were concentrated on the problem and you know the problem is continuous in nature so that's why we like when mm. we written down what we wanted our uh, bellman function to satisfy it was always you know written in the form of the hessian i i'm asking because um this single integrals estimates, for example, Martingale type estimate mm -hmm. uh, for for Orlich functions for Orlich classes uh, was obtained by Sergey Trail and myself, mm -hmm. and was much more difficult than the usual mm -hmm. than LP. Yes, 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 it is much more difficult. And because we, I think it's more, more mostly because we actually don't have main uh, inequality uh, for these classes. And it was exactly some trick, some strange trick, but it wasn't even the Bellman function, it was Bellman functional. So mm -hmm. maybe this method makes it much easier. And uh, yeah, yeah, like uh, I only found like a, a paper from you, you and uh, Sergey and you, Sergey and Seja, uh, Feja about uh, mentioning Bellman function in all its spaces, and that's about it. Like that, there's there's really not much in the literature. Absolutely, so, absolutely. I think it's one maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but it was much more involved proof. So maybe this this will allow much more direct. Yeah, because th this is this is quite direct. Because I mean, the function is explicitly constructed. But yeah, I I I I don't know, mm -hmm. like, how would one even get to something like the main inequality? Mm -hmm. So, uh, what was the uh, like? What was the connection? How did you make a connection to like that specific Bellman function out of all of them? 
Well, I mean, there's there's really not that much. I mean, you try mm -hmm. <laughs> when you when you first, you know, like you mm -hmm. think in the standard Nazaro trail, so you have the spa, the powers, mm -hmm. and now in, instead of having powers, you just um, replace them with young young functions. So first, what you mm -hmm. try to do is you try to have expressions that can be dominated by the sum of those two uh, by the sum of those two functions okay so you have something similar to nazaro trail and of course then you are limited uh, with the young inequality so you know actually which expressions you can bound from the upper side uh, side and which expressions you you don't you don't know anything about so that's like the first first thing you do and then, of course, you uh, immediately see that you get a couple of uh, a couple of good good choices that uh, that satisfy the upper bound, and they're at uh, the functions that are, uh, for instance, continuous. But then the problem was when checking uh, the C1 property. And then by checking C1, you see, aha, okay, then you can eliminate a lot a lot of things, mm -hmm. and then you know. Playing, I mean, playing a bit, but you know, quite actually, when you uh, when you uh, spend some time on it, some things really get cleared. In this yeah, and I, I think that Bellman function was used in a bunch of other stuff as well. Yes, yes, yes. That that Bellman function was was used in a lot of stuff. Yeah. I, I, I have no idea how, how many things it was used. Maybe Sasha knows better. I know it was used yeah, Sasha, in, Sasha all this, in all these bilinear embeddings uh, by, uh, that Oliver was working. And uh, for, for Schrodinger operator. Yes, exactly. Littlewood Paley and then this. Uh, um, um, Divergence form complex uh, operators with complex coefficients and stuff like that. So this is just the first attempt to generalize something to Orlit spaces. Of course, it has a lot of limitations, but like for me, the most interesting part was actually this Bellman function. Mm -hmm. I know that not a lot of people care about Bellman. Oh, but we do. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like I know that you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would listen to another talk just on just on this part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we can we can we can then you know meet and talk you know because uh, it would be uh, then we can discuss the the details of the Bellman function if you're interesting. That, yeah, that very. was fun because all all the other all the other things are standard like the method mm -hmm. of proving the bilinear embedding and everything else is standard once you have the Bellman function. Mm -hmm. So the problem was for using this kind of direct proof finding the Bellman function. So yeah. hopefully. I don't know. Maybe maybe it will have some other applications. Also, for now, I I have no idea. Christina, is it an archive? Uh, yes, yes, the paper is an archive. Mm -hmm. um, are there other questions? Irina asked and disappeared. <laughs> Can you span on the Bellman ah, function? Ah, she froze. Okay, well, thank, let's thank Christina again.